Welcome. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for coming. If you can take your seats, we are going to start this round table. Uh -huh. We have a couple of persons who still miss. Well, bonjour. Bonjour à tout le monde. Dopre de dien. Buenos dias. Bon dia. Siahu Hao. Konnichiwa. Welcome, everybody, to this World Environment Day. This is the World Environment Day, so it's an important day for all of us. And also because we will be having this, uh, this group, this high-level roundtable here, uh, so we all welcome you to you. And we, we will be very strict in time, so we have to go fast. So, Erica. Uh -huh. We're going to talk more about the uh, ground rules, so to speak, for our roundtable in just a few moments. But before we do that, I would like to uh, welcome to the podium uh, Professor Petri Talas, who, of course, is the Secretary General of the WMO. was a long distance my daily exercise perhaps. <laughs> so uh, thanks for coming to this event and uh, I would regard this event as a historical event. Uh, we have never brought uh, so many private sector, public sector and uh, science and academic sector players around the table and uh, this is a demonstration from on behalf of WMO that we are we are moving in a new direction and uh, and, and you are you are facilitating this uh, this change. So we have our holy book, our uh, convention, which is on my table there. Perhaps Dimitar could show it. Uh, and and, and uh, that book is uh, talking about the mandate of uh, WMO. And, and in that book, it's clearly said that we are supposed to serve the interest of the, of the governments, but it doesn't say who are the players there. It's, it's, uh, and in, in, our, in our current world, we have uh, both uh, public sector, meteorological, and hydrological services, uh, we have academic sector, and, and we have a growing amount of public uh, private sector who, who are providing both observations and, uh, and services. And, and uh, to, to, to serve the interest of the governments and the people in the countries, uh, all these sectors uh, should uh, contribute to the success of, uh, of our work. And that's, our, that's very much our, our basis. And uh, from our side, we are very, very much interested in enhancing the cooperation with the private sector and also science and innovation sector. And, um, and, and uh, during this Congress of WMO that we are having this week and the coming week, we are supposed to approve a Geneva Declaration, which, which is stating uh, this, uh, this uh, will. And, um, and we are friends of concrete action. We, we hope that this is not only talking, but we are, we are, this is a serious issue for us, and we would like to invite the uh, private sector and also innovation and science sectors uh, to be part of our constituent body work in the future. We have uh, technical commissions, and which we are just revising, and we have regional associations. We have our executive council and, and Congress. And we would be happy to see all of you uh, contributing to the success of those uh, bodies' work in the future. Besides that, uh, we, are, we also we would like to deal with uh, code of ethics, which is very much an issue that we are dealing with uh, in, in the UN framework, uh, how, how, to, how to cooperate and, and what are the certain limitations there. We would like to see legal bases uh, set up at, at the national level, how, how, what are the roles of the private sector and, uh, and public sector. And uh, we have fairly mature examples of those uh, from various parts of the world. We have Asian examples, European examples, uh, North American examples, and, uh, and so forth. But we have also common, common interest. Uh, uh, we we, we all, all are very much interested in keeping the publicly financed uh, infrastructure up, up and running. That's the backbone of uh, everything. And also, our WMO Resolution 40 is a backbone of everything. This uh, free exchange of data uh, is, is going to be the key issue for us also in the future. That's not, that, that cannot be uh, questioned. 
And we would be happy to see this happening at the global level, regional level, and, and also at the national level. And, and the key uh, for success, especially at the national level, is trust. So we have to build more trust between the various players, and, and, and that would allow us to join, join forces and build win-win uh, partnerships. So with, with these words, uh, uh, thanks once again for coming, and uh, I'm very much looking forward to the outcome of this uh, event and, and your intellectual contributions to the success of our future approach. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Tallis, for taking us on this journey and for making the journey up to the podium <laughs> early this afternoon. So again, this discussion today is a high-level discussion. Uh, that means that we are not here to solve the problems, but we are here to pinpoint the problems that are of the biggest concern, uh, and those are the ones that we are going to move forward with after this two-day long event. So this is the launch of the open consultative platform. Uh, we are here today to find ways to work together, uh, not uh, to uh, look at our own needs, but the needs of the entire community. And again, as Professor Tallis said, we are here to build trust as well. Um, a couple of the uh, items that I mentioned before, the ground rules. Um, everyone who is invited to speak today, you have approximately one minute to speak, and we need to keep on that time budget. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but I know that there is a wealth of ideas in this room. If you are not invited to speak and, and or if you run out of time, we have an email address that you should send your ideas to. Everything will be collaborated. Everybody's input is valued, and everybody's input will be appreciated. So please use this email address, ppe at wmo.int. Again, ppe at wmo.int. And we will appreciate everybody's feedback so very much, but we are going to uh, keep times very, very short today. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a, an elevator pitch, what we ask you to do today, uh, because it's more to collect points that, 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 that to make a debate today. So we are not, uh, we're not here to find solutions, but to work on the way to find the solutions in the future. Uh, we, ca we have the, the agenda of what, what we'll be doing uh, the day one and the day two. Erica? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. yes. We have this multi-panel today. We, we, we have five uh, themes that come, that, that come from, from the first survey we did uh, the previous days. So uh, from this survey, we, they pop up five themes. And one of, uh, we will split these five themes in two days. And then every day we have a general summary of the, of the, of the themes of the day. And uh, we, we will have a plan mm -hmm. uh, for, the, for, the, for the joint uh, declaration. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you could see on the screen the five major themes that we have narrowed down the responses. Uh, theme number one is uh, talking about data. Theme number two, forecasting. Theme number three, uh, services. Tomorrow we will go into subjects four and five, the capacity gap, and talking about roles and responsibilities within the enterprise. Mm -hmm. So let's go for the, for the first one, for the data. This, this was maybe the, the, the most astonishing and, and, and the one who first popped up uh, and gave strong consensus about the expected exponential increase in the future of the available observations and including expansion of in-situ and remote sensing observation as well as observations from non-conventional platforms and sources. Uh, we have seven speakers today with a summary at the end uh, for this theme. The first one we invite to talk is Sue Barrell and can you give us your, your point on this emerging issue about data? Mm -hmm. Starting now. Um, yeah. uh, one of the, the, the key highlights to come out of the review is, is ongoing recognition that data is our lifeblood and that WMO, through the work of the World Weather Watch, has done data for a long time. In fact, the World Weather Watch, uh, I think, was well ahead in, in understanding the challenges of the data landscape well before anyone coined the term the data age. Um, it served us very well, but, and, but we're well on a pathway to be, uh, to, to be um, evolving it into the future. 
and recognising a lot of the challenges that members are facing. Uh, while people get very nervous about all these new things, big data, IoT, AI, all of that, it does well to remind ourselves about the value of the World Weather Watch and the structures and the systems that we have in place that we need to build on into the future and how well it supports the cascading model of delivery right through to the users uh, across the WMO system. What the review further highlighted uh, are two key things. One, the need for WMO to take a convening role and host a, a data conference, which will bring together players right across all of the sectors to look at innovative pathways forward and really prepare for the future and provide ongoing and provide some guidance that feeds back into WMO, um, the further development within the WMO and also across all of the players. And the second, I guess, key thing that we highlighted is the need for a review of WMO data policies. Again, involving all players, recognising that we have a huge strength in the policies we already have and that we look at them and review them with caution, but we do so with a need to make sure that the, the, the guidance we provided to members, the regulations, but also the broader landscape and the players that, involve, uh, that work in that space have a common understanding of how we can work best together to ensure that we do share data, uh, to drive our global NWP and to deliver services right through to the members at the end of the line. Thank you. Uh, next, we'd like to invite Alan Ratir, uh, Director General of UMETSAT. Uh, satellite data, uh, primary importance uh, as we move forward. It seems that there will be a mixture of data from traditional providers and from those, uh, from those that are uh, operating cheaper satellites, if we want to put it that way. How is that going to work? Uh, first of all, you need to realize we need not only more data, but better data. And if you look at the history of numerical weather prediction, progress has been achieved with better data. And better data in terms of satellite is not a utility. So we have uh, the Vision 2040, which will be approved for the WIGOS, which will be approved by this Congress, which sets the scene for better and more data. But what matters is impact in the end. And, uh, uh, better data and more data uh, will be assessed by their impact, in particular, numerical weather prediction. And when it comes to sharing data, I think whatever comes out for, from the data policy uh, discussion within WMO, it's absolutely essential that all global NWP centers get access to the same set of critical uh, satellite products to work on a fair competition basis, because we have to accept, and it's fortunate, that NWP is a scientific competition and needs to continue to be so to bring forward meteorology uh, with better forecasts for citizens and the economy. Thank you. Thank you for your contribution. You're, you're going short. Uh, that will give us more time for, for debate or during the day. Thank you very much. Uh, as Mr. Ratier said, the, the data, data and, and, and for, for science and for research, we have the next floor for Einstein Hawk, the president of WMO Commission for Atmospheric Science. And science and data are, are really related. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, data for research. Uh, in WMO, we say the banner for science is science for service. And uh, it is furthermore um, an approach from going from weather prediction to earth system prediction. And that is a large broadening because it includes weather, water, climate, uh, terrestrial systems, ocean, ice, uh, biogeochemical cycles, uh, um, a large widening. At the same time, we see that uh, there is a rapid broadening of data sources. There is a rapid broadening of quality or, re or quality requirements because if we think in a value chain or value cycle mode where we have a discovery, translation, application, and we have back-end and front-end systems in the front-end systems which are becoming rather large in many societal sectors. The need for, for data are not the same as in the back-end uh, uh, forecasting systems. So that means that there is a large, large broadening of the data sources required and, uh, and the broadening of the applications of data. And we see that there is a growth in non-regulated data collection also outside of WMO, and we see there is a large growth in societal value of the observation and model-driven applications. So it's a very growing field, and it's, it's not easy to get to have an overview of it. Uh, I think the system orientation is very important because that 
serves, serves so many interests and, and things hang together. Uh, what I will say in the end is that um, uh, we have a dilemma for any data, and that is the intellectual property rights versus the need for data to be a part of the commons, the global commons or the local commons. And the third um, corner of this triangle is the threat that <coughs> the winner takes it all, that if the altruism is too widespread, that someone actually collects everything and, and win in the end, which is to monopolize the field, which I think would be very detrimental, but not unlikely. Um, we need the input from everybody here and also the intellectual capacity to get the products right. But I would say that the age of altruism is over. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, next, Jim Anderson from Earth Networks. As a representative of the private sector, what are the main issues in data sharing and data exchange um, that you foresee? Well, there are a lot of uh, important issues in, in data exchange. I'll highlight one, which is data rights and having clearly understood uh, usage rights for data that that meet all the needs of all the parties, that um, uh, ensure the sovereignty of the countries and the central role of the NMHSs, um, but also provide and encourage uh, you know, the commercialization of that data to enable um, better products for, for more end users. And having clear, consistent data rights can really help the private sector in, in developing uh, uh, more uses for uh, the important data that can save lives and property. Um, and, and in doing so, creating a level playing field with those data rights so that um, uh, governments and commercial entities can all kind of work uh, together to solve all the urgent problems we have. And then I, I guess you also asked about the da uh, data mart as a potential way of, uh, of, of working on this. And so there's been a lot of discussion around having a data exchange and potentially uh, an economic platform for uh, the trading of data or the buying and selling of data. And this could, could if done correctly, uh, you know, provide a platform that incentivizes um, the investment in uh, networks and also the sustainment of, of observing networks to fill a lot of the huge data gaps that, that exist and have been highlighted by the WMO and by others. And, and obviously that's a problem that's existed for a long time and so if we can create the right economic model and come up with a way to fill those gaps and then really sustain them over time and hopefully overcome that, that long-standing challenge. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. You have the private sector. And then we have now Gerhard Hadrian, uh, who's the permanent representative of Germany at WMO and can give us the European perspective, maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I come from Germany. Germany is a member of the, U uh, of the European Union, and that's more or less my perspective. I'm speaking here. There's this uh, in the European <coughs> Union uh, a legislation, the Directive on the Reuse of Public Sector Information. The idea and the concept and the request to all member states is really to make all governmental data free, available for additional use or for reuse for to develop and to, to provide additional and new services. I think that's a basic concept we have in the European Union. There's also a legislation about the, the cooperation between the private and the public sector and the data exchange there uh, concerning the intellectual property right in this, in, in this way. This, um, the second, and this is, or let's say, from my perspective, this directive or this legislation is consistent to the WMO Resolution 40, which was mentioned by the, director, uh, by the Secretary General. And the basic principle is the free and unrestricted access to an essential data set. I think this asset we must not give up. And unrestricted might means without any discrimination. And this is a basic principle we should also have in our rules, also with the cooperation with the private sector, uh, without any discrimination, that everybody has the same access to the same data sets. But this free exchange of data, of course, this requires that all WMO members are able to provide these uh, data and to fulfill its, their obligation. That means there's also support necessary. And of course, we have to recognize also in all the, this discussion, 
the free available services on the basis of observational data in the WMO programs coming from the WMO programs, but as well as of uh, different organizations, especially intergovernmental organizations, and these are, of course, WMO, we are here, but also examples from, Euro from Europe, these are UMITSAT, ECMWF, or the programs of the European Union, like Copernicus. Copernicus as the world largest uh, Earth observation program. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, now I'd like to invite Kiel Forsen uh, from Vaisala to speak as one of the biggest equipment manufacturers in the weather enterprise. Uh, in the future, there will be many, many new data resources, but we'll be facing dish issues about data quality. So how do we handle that issue with quality of data in the future? Well, I was happy to hear your reference here that not only do we need more data, which we are certainly going to get from, from sources we don't even know about yet, but that we also do need more quality data. So far, to me, that really has been the, the paradigm in the MET community, that, that high quality data is what adds value and, and makes sure that the forecast is better and better. And I, I think that is something which should not be compromised going forward. I think in addition to getting new sort of more lower quality data sources, we are going to get also new more high quality data sources. We ourselves are working on such at the moment and I think there will be uh, great additions coming from new technologies going forward. This is a huge investment which is needed from the entire community. It's very much about the cooperation between all of us, really, to, to take the art of high-quality observations forward. But uh, we've done it before, and we can do it also going forward. So what I really want to stress is, is uh, that we should not compromise the data quality and integrity. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, you know, we have come to the end of this uh, first theme. Um, you, all of you have a really fast uh, pitch <laughs> elevator intervention. Thank you very much. And just remind that we are opening this open consultative platform, which is kind of an open science uh, place to, to develop the future. And all of you are welcome to participate in the future open uh, platform. But now, if you have ideas of something that uh, some of the speakers have said, you can send this email. Uh, and with your opinions. And then we have uh, Petria Talas, Professor Talas, uh, who asked him to make a summary of this uh, first theme, please. Thank you. I think that you were all raising very important uh, issues and, um, and, and, and it's clear that we have to respect the Resolution 40 spirit also in the future, but there's a need to update the appendix, which is uh, mentioning which data should be freely exchanged. Then we have a challenge to get the more data available, especially from our less developed uh, member countries, and, and, and that's, that's having at the moment a negative impact on the quality of the, of the products in, in those areas, but also, also worldwide. And, um, and, and data policy issue is also very important for us, and, and for us, from our perspective, we are very much promoting free access to data, and of course we have to create the business models for private sector, how they how they get their revenue and, and uh, who is going to pay for the global free access to data, as, as, uh, as Professor Adrian was uh, just uh, mentioning. Uh, besides the high quality standardized, the WMO standardized data, we, we have plenty of uh, new opportunities uh, coming from mobile phones, uh, cars, uh, home-based home instruments, and uh, we have to deal with uh, such data as well. And those data sets are also adding value to our, our products. And, um, and, and, and this free access to data, that's, that's very important, and, and we are happy to promote also that at the national level. Many governments are expecting the MET services to earn money by selling data, and, and this is really limiting the economic value of those uh, observations. And, and, and European countries have shown quite nice example of uh, opening their data and, and, and enhancing the economic uh, value of that. And WMO is uh, going to organize a data conference early next year to discuss many of those items and, uh, and agree how to, how to proceed with those important issues. Thank you.
That concludes theme number one. Uh, let's have a round of applause for all of our speakers so far. And we are moving on to theme number two, forecasting and forecasters. Uh, everyone who mentioned uh, the future of forecasting in their survey pretty much had consensus around the idea that AI and machine learning is the future and that hand-drawn forecasts by humans is in the past. Uh, I have a quote from one of our survey participants. Uh, Earth system modeling capability is built on a global level supported by interoperable observation systems for the provision of weather, water, climate, marine, and environmental services. The seamless global data processing and forecasting system forms the basis. The first person I'd like to invite to speak is Florence Rebier. Uh, from the ECMWF, uh, and I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name, I did my best. Mm -hmm. uh, is Earth system, I want to ask you, is Earth system modeling a realistic possibility, uh, and how does uh, the European uh, service plan to achieve that? Uh, certainly there are different levels of Earth system, but we are going in that direction, and what we call Earth system for doing medium range weather forecasting is coupling the atmosphere with the land, with the ocean, with the waves, with the sea ice, and possibly later with aerosols and ozone and constituents. We don't go to the a fully, fully Earth system, including the growing of vegetation, etc., as maybe for the longer predictions. But still, it's much more than just the atmosphere. And so we need to observe as well these components, including the ocean, which is very important. So it's a reality, the Earth system. We need more observations from all these fields and more exchange of observation. This is our blood in, indeed. Like uh, Sue said, we, we cannot live without high quality observations, not only of the weather, but of all the other parameters. So we are doing steps. And uh, now at the European Weather Center, all our systems are fully coupled even from the day one prediction between all the components I've already described. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is the point of ECMWF, but, but now next speaker is Kevin Petty from IBM and the weather company. And your company has announced a plan to run a high resolution global model this year. And what are the expectations of utilizing a non-traditional and IoT uh, technology for the future? Well, I think the, the future overall is bright, and maybe I can answer that from the perspective of, you know, what we're here to really address today is how do we as a community work together to solve some of the world's most challenging problems. And what we have to realize is that within our community there is an evolution going on, whether we want to recognize that or not. And that evolution that I'm referring to is the fact that uh, the private sector continues to grow, and not only grow in terms of size, but in terms of competency. And when we talk about tackling some of the world's most challenging problems, the private sector cannot do it alone. It, it needs to work with other parts of our community, and we all have to come together, whether we're public, private, or academic. And in terms of uh, the forecasting that, that was referenced, uh, you know, the weather company IBM is uh, setting an example by working with organizations such as the National Center for Atmospheric Research. We recognize once again that we can't do it all ourselves uh, in terms of achieving our goals and the goals of the community. And those traditional uh, forecasting approaches are going to continue to be a fundamental part of our community. But I'll also say we're going to push the envelope in other areas of bringing in things like artificial intelligence, excuse me, and machine learning um, to, to tackle, once again, some of these challenging uh, uh, problems. And if I can finish just by saying that um, weather data is a, going to be a funda fundamental part of what we do moving forward, but there's going to be these other data sets as well that we're going to have to bring in and create new forecasting uh, capabilities and techniques. So thank you. Thank you. I'd like to invite Tim Palmer to speak now uh, from University of Oxford. Um, give us your view on weather prediction. What's the biggest challenge? Uh, is a perfect forecast even something that's feasible? Okay, thank you. Um, there's no such thing as a perfect forecast, um, whether it's 2030 or 3030 or any, any time. There's no such thing as a perfect forecast because there's always uncertainty, and the laws of physics tell you 
this will affect the forecast. Um, when I spent a lot of my career at ECMWF, and in the early days I argued very much against the idea of putting most of the computer resources into just increasing model resolution, because there's no point in having a precise forecast at day seven or something that's wrong half the time. So we, you know, over the last decades, we've developed uh, the idea of ensemble forecasting in medium range, in fact, on all time scales now, climate change. Um, and this basically has allowed uh, forecasters to get a quantitative estimate of the uncertainty in the forecast. So that's, that's an, been an important step, not only in the utility of forecast, but making it a scientifically credible uh, enterprise. Having reached that stage, I do now think that the crucial issue is about model resolution. And I think the one thing that's holding us back in weather forecasting and indeed climate change is our reliance on parameterizations for crucially important uh, processes. So I mentioned three, convective uh, cloud systems, orographic gravity wave drag, and for oceans, the, the mesoscale eddy problem, ocean mesoscale eddies. These can all be solved if we could get down to about a one kilometer grid with our global models. Um, and this is possible now with the advent of exascale computing technology, which will come online in a few years' time. I think this is the single most important issue facing numerical weather prediction. And I say that, you know, despite the various uh, talks we've already had about data, I do not at all dispute the importance of better and more valuable observations. But those observations are useless unless they can be assimilated into our models. And I would say the one thing that is holding back numerical weather prediction at the moment is the inability to assimilate observations, high resolution satellite observations into models. When we look at forecast failures, such as at ECMWF, uh, we see that the situations where forecasts go wrong is quite often when the initial conditions upstream, let's say, of Europe are dominated by organized convective cloud systems. So the circulations are unable to be resolved by the models. So the, the observations which are, which are influenced by those circulations cannot be assimilated. The information cannot be assimilated into the models. The cost of an exascale computer is very comparable with you know, a small satellite program, so it's not a big investment in, in money. So that, for me, is the single most important thing uh, for big organizations like ECMWF and the National Weather Service in the US and elsewhere to improve prediction. So we'll have cloud-resolved ensemble, global ensemble forecasting. That, for me, is the vital next step if we want to make a real step change in forecasting ability. We have data, we have forecast. This is we are weather people, so <laughs> that's what we like that. <laughs> we, we change to the other side of the, of, the, of the ocean. And then next speaker will be David Parsons from the University of Oklahoma. And it's not only the, the weather for the next days, but it's, only the weather, it's also the weather for the, for the future, because we are in, in a changing climate. <coughs> then the, the expectation for the future will even go even farther. Huh? Um, so I... Um, agree with a lot of the comments of uh, Tim Palmer. I think that uh, moving to high resolution, uh, it's not just the assimilation, but actually the problems with the model physics uh, during the, uh, the model runs that cause the forecast bus. Um, but I, I think that uh, moving to Earth systems and uh, moving to high resolution convective permitting models um, really requires a transformation in uh, our research expenditures. And for people that are using models, uh, model output in the developing world, it's going to be a large amount of data that needs to be uh, either summarized or transferred <coughs> to uh, developing countries around the world. So I think as we move uh, to those scales, uh, research is important. Uh, the data transmission for uh, users outside of the large centers is important. But I think this also calls for a paradigm shift in education. If we're moving to uh, from drawing weather maps to uh, deep learning techniques, including machine learning, these other things, uh, we really have to have a paradigm shift in, in how we educate our atmospheric scientists, not just in the leading countries with the uh, big operational centers, but around the world. And I think this really calls for a, a partnership between the operational private sector and the academic uh, educational communities. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Carl Gutberg from Meteo Blue. Again, sorry if I mispronounced your name. <laughs> um, 
I would like you to talk about how weather forecasting is progressing and how it is changing the profession of the weather forecaster. Okay, sorry, I haven't done this before. Thank you very much. I would like to agree with the previous speakers and acti um, uh, um, artificial intelligence is really enabling us to make better forecasts. We're able to combine models and get quantum leaps in precision of the in the range of 20% as compared to the single models alone. I think I'd like to put another message here on behalf of the private sector. This can only be done with a big public effort uh, which has been invested into the infrastructure and the models as such. So we will not be able to do this alone as a private sector. So this fundamental infrastructure uh, necessity has to be communicated to the stakeholders, to the public and politicians. We cannot replace that with private competition. And the other message I'd like to do is th place is that with the evolution of forecasting, the ability to u of, u of use those data will increase so massively that we have to jointly work on the different value chains and see how we can index and better characterize these data so we have common understanding. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Next one is uh, Sarah Jones from Double Dutch Weather Deans and also the World Weather Research Program. And uh, we'll be talking about the, this need of, of uh, cooperation, coordination even between forecasting centers and also uh, an improved and inclusive uh, relationship between public, private, and academia. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Yes, I'd like to think about how the research effort can, can benefit through improved collaboration and cooperation. And there is a very strong tradition of working in partnership in research and development for numerical weather prediction and for forecasting tools. Um, the NMHSs have been working in consortia for a long time. And at DWD, we've gone the route, we went the route about 10 years ago of having a partnership with an academic institution <coughs> to develop our operational forecast model. And at the WMO, you mentioned the Global Data Processing and Forecasting System, which is a network of global and regional centers providing a range of informa uh, information on a range of timescales and variables. So the tradition is strong, it's there, but it can certainly be improved. And if we think about improving forecasts, we have to improve the, there's, there's some very long-term development work to be done on the infrastructure, on the observing systems, NWP, the post-processing, the tools. And as the previous speaker mentioned, there's a very strong responsibility from the public sector to do this work, but all sectors can contribute. And there's also the innovative pro product development, which is something we want to see happening in, in the private sector, in the public sector, really anyone who can provide things to information to users in a quick and timely manner. So how can we accelerate this process? Um, I think the key here is, is co-design of research between the people using the information and the people developing the information. Examples of this from DWD, we worked with energy companies to identify the weaknesses in our NWP forecast um, system so that we can improve the information for the stability of the national grid. From WWRP, the Polar Prediction Project worked together with companies um, responsible for transportation in the goods sector, in the tourism sector, and we have pilot projects for seasonal to sub-seasonal prediction looking um, at adapting agriculture to climate, for example, in developing countries. So we want to be inclusive. We want to get the people who need the information together with the people who are developing the information to improve what we're offering. Thank you. Finally, on this topic, we have Jay Trobeck. Uh, you communicate the forecast information directly to the public. Uh, so what changes have you made to your approach, especially within the past 10 years, uh, but 10 years from now, will the broadcast meteorologist even exist in its current form? Sure. Uh, I'd like to think so. Um, <laughs> <laughs> one thing that we have found is we try and we're always trying to do a better job of communicating the forecast, and always trying to do a better job of doing <coughs> the forecast itself. As communicators, <coughs> we're still the interface between what is the forecast and the people. And no matter what we do in terms of, I mean, we, we're always trying to get better data, we're always trying to get better uh, predictions from uh, numerical weather prediction and things like that. But 
the main thing is is communicating to people, especially in times of high impact weather. And what we've noticed, even in this days where everybody can get a forecast on their phone and it's become kind of a commodity, we still find that when there are high impact weather events that we still have a role and people do tune in. And one thing that we have found, um, even young people who are inclined not to watch television anymore, at least in the United States, they will tune in when there's high impact weather. So I think there will always be a role. Now, one thing that will be changing, of course, is with the technology and now we'll have more directed signals, so more narrow casting than broadcasting is the way that the television industry is going. We need to figure out how to do a better job of adapting our message to hone it down to individual uh, communities and higher resolution uh, forecasts for individual places in our viewing area. Thank you, Jay. I've noticed that many of you are taking notes and, and having ideas. I remember that we are opening this open consultative platform, so respect from these notes you have been taking, to, to be, you send them uh, to this email, ppwm. Uh, international so we can share and we can uh, take advance of your opinion of your ideas but for the making the summary of this uh, second theme forecast and forecasters we invite Pavel Kabat uh, chief uh, WMO chief scientist and to give the point of WMO and the future of this cooperation I'm here good uh, afternoon so very briefly because of time I think uh, two or three notions came very very strongly across here notion of true partnership, partnership between the research and academia, which came from different corners of the room, which I think is able to reach out on a very practical basis. And on the other hand, the uh, NVP community, with a clear recognition that there is a landslide change coming on us. And I think I would like to refer to a couple of comments here, which were made in different languages, so to speak, where we have a over-parameterized space currently. We are actually hitting the end of the, of, the, of the age when it comes to the parallel computing. We are talking about artificial intelligence, not really knowing sometimes what we talk about. And I see this is coming very, very, very soon on us. And I see this is what we are calling for. So I would summarize this session by a kind of joint call for a partnership to address these challenges which are around the corner very quickly in this um, truly part partnered uh, way, academia, the uh, NMHSs, and uh, private sector. One thing which I would like to add, uh, connecting this session, a previous session, which came out only marginally, I think we are also um, uh, uh, seeing the age of the complete new data, I mean the big data, crowdsourcing data, public data, where we have a problem of quality, we have a problem of assessing how, how good they are. We would like to probably assimilate them on the long term, but this is far-fetched, so I think the big data as a part of the uh, equation should be also uh, discussed at the same level as the artificial intelligence. Thank you. Thank you very much. Then we have gone to the end of uh, theme two.